Good afternoon, uh, everybody. Uh, welcome to this uh, masterclass. Uh, it's great to uh, to have you all here uh, virtually. Uh, a whole uh, different experience, of course, from uh, uh, all sitting together and having a cup of coffee together and things like that. But at the same time, I think uh, I find it in any case also quite convenient. You know, I uh, you know it's it's uh, quite quite. Uh, quite a lot of extra opportunities and possibilities that you get by uh, using uh, uh, systems like um, uh, Teams and Zoom and webcasting, etc. So a warm welcome. I, I looked at the list. We've got some hundred people registered and we expect, you know, on um, 70 or 80 to actually be part of the, the talk today. Uh, I recognize quite a few of you and uh, Danielle, Ian, Peter, Oleg, Ray, Sandy, Stephen, uh, and of course everybody else, you know, uh, it's really good to uh, to be with you. It's a pity I can't see you uh, and, uh, you know, have personal contact, but uh, it's really lovely to uh, uh, to be together in, uh, in this particular uh, fashion way. Um, a couple of housekeeping uh, uh, points. Uh, you're all on mute. Please keep on mute to uh, avoid background and all sorts of other disturbances. And, and obviously, when we have questions later on, absolutely uh, unmute and, um, and, and uh, talk to us. Um, the questions can be put on the chat so that Mark, uh, Mark Portlock from uh, the AS ACS who is actually um, managing the whole thing that he will keep in contact with me so we can organize the questions as they come in um, uh, later on. Uh, we also ask you actually not to share your video. It's four o'clock. All the kids are coming home and Netflixes and games are going to be on and uh, preferable in order to um, protect uh, bandwidth. Uh, you know, it might be better not to uh, not to share the video. Uh, in order to uh, to not slow us down. Uh, my name is Paul Budder. Uh, I am uh, involved in this industry for the last 30 years, uh, quite involved more on the strategic side, uh, on the business side of telecommunications, and um, uh, not just in Australia, internationally. It's really have uh, good to have this, uh, this, this international uh, perspective. We are an international industry, an international community, and it's really great to uh, to come together in, in this way as well. And again, with uh, systems like this, uh, people can join from all over the world and, and, and do so. So that's um, that's an extra bonus that we get in, uh, in a situation like that. Um, as I mentioned uh, already, Mark, uh, this, the, it's organized both by the Australian Computer Society and the Australian Smart Communities Association uh, to um, uh, uh, stalwart uh, uh, associations, you know, that have been in operation in Australia for a long time. And, and I would like to uh, uh, commend and, and congratulate the two organizations with uh, bringing these uh, masterclasses on. As you know, there will be three masterclasses. You're automatically registered for all uh, for all three. And um, it's great to have these experts uh, that are appearing over the three sessions to talk to us and provide uh, their insights in um, in uh, this particular topic and, and obviously this particular topic is about 5G and um, uh, we've got two experts who are going really interesting talking interestingly about uh, the background the technology uh, engineering aspects of it uh, uh, of, of, of what what is it all about you know what what actually is uh, uh, 5G what are the fundamentals uh, how does it fit in with 4G and uh, and other things uh, I think you know when I thought about it, I wrote down a number of um, a number of um, words: 5G, magic, mysterious, hype, potential, affordability. Yeah, all sorts of things are um, are going through my mind, looking at it more from a strategic uh, level. You know, where's the business model? You know, what's happening with mill millimeter waves? Uh, you know, what's happening in smart cities, smart energy uh, topics that I'm really, um, really interested in. And that's the sort of thing that we are going to uh, to talk about. Now, having given you a little bit of an, an introduction, Mark will put up uh, a poll uh, to actually find out where do you guys fit in? You know, what are your interests? What is where um, uh, the sort of things that you 
uh, um, like to see in relation to 5G? You know, just give us a bit of your insights in um, in um, uh, in your thoughts about about 5G and this session. I, I just give you an, um, a minute or so to to do it. It's, 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 it shouldn't be much of a problem. It's straightforward answers. And uh, then in a minute, uh, you know, Mark will will show the um, the outcome of uh, of that as well. Ah, fascinating! Really fascinating. Yeah, really good. So uh, it's it's uh, you know we've got really quite a strategic sort of uh, uh, level of interest um, in in that in that area, and yeah, it's amazing you know that uh, you know that the application side is uh, is of um, uh, a lot of a lot of interest, of course. Uh, yeah, that's uh, that's good to see. You know that's um, yeah. Um, so. Um, what I would uh, now like to do is is present the two um, uh, speakers to you that uh, are going to present to you, and I uh, I start with uh, Jeff Jeff Hayden, and um, I know Jeff I don't know Jeff for how long but uh, many 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 years, and uh, I have very often uh, contacted uh, Jeff in the past. When I had technical questions, um, and particularly I remember Jeff, uh, the time that we worked very hard on the fiber to the home network, uh, with, together with the government and and the industry group, and we um, uh, we tackled a lot of things. And and Jeff was my buddy, you know, who I could always uh, contact and who could um, explain to me uh, what this was all about. Uh, he has an enormous amount of experience in the industry. Uh, he has been involved in many, many uh, activities, both on a government level and on an industry level. Uh, he knows so much about the technology that it's really not, would you say, easy, but he has a good insight on what's going to happen from here on. So he can point you in the direction of, from a technology point of view, of, of what's going to happen. Um, so that futuristic element is is also another another um, uh, strength from uh, from Jeff that uh, that he has been doing for many many years and continues to do. So one of the latest things that Jeff has been of late is over a couple of years is the 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 the, the whole uh, situation of IoT. He was a big uh, one of the first to really start pushing for it and set up the ICT Alliance. Uh, in relation to uh, IoT, and he's still very much involved uh, in that as well. Um, so that's uh, that's Jeff. I think to make it easy for the the, the next um, uh, to a seamless sort of uh, change from Jeff to to Matt, I will I will introduce Matt at the same time. Now, uh, Matt and I also know each other for many many years, and um, and particularly in the last um, decade or so when we started to move into uh, new areas as uh, smart city, uh, smart uh, energy, you know, sustainability, where uh, our technologies, where our industry uh, can play a key role in the digital transformation that is going to take place, is, is, is taking place and is further going to take place. And I think with the coronavirus, uh, uh, you know, will actually stimulate us to do more. Look at teleworking and telehealth and teleeducation. I mean, things we've been battling for for a decade and now within weeks and months, it suddenly is embraced by, by um, you know, very, very last part of the population. And not only the population, business managers, the healthcare provi uh, providers, etc., the professionals, you know, these people have been quite reluctant to, uh, to become involved and now are involved. And that's a great thing. Matt comes from that particular uh, background of, uh, in this situation, the city. Uh, so he has, uh, you know, he has that broader, that holistic view of technology in the context of, of, of a city. Ipswich was definitely and still is one of the, the leading cities in, in Australia in relation to smart cities. I've been working with, with Ipswich and Matt and, and, and altogether some 25 cities around the world 
in uh, in uh, trying to progress the, the strategic thinking of smart cities and and met and, and and the city of which which have been um, instrumental in uh, in in, uh, in in these activities and and I would like to uh, to commend Matt for his fantastic work what he has done not just for Ipswich but also for um, the whole smart smart city community in Australia. So these are my uh, two, not just colleagues, but two friends in uh, in the industry that I would like to uh, introduce to you. And then the next thing for me, uh, Jeff, is to um, to hand it over to you and to um, uh, uh, give the screen to you. And uh, uh, I'm very interested to hear what what you have to say about the developments of 5G. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. And, uh... Thank you for those very kind words. I think my summary of all of that is I'm just really old and have done a lot of stuff over 45 years of working in the telecommunications industry. Um, and in fact, uh, one of the reasons why I found this whole subject of 5G so interesting is because my, a good portion of my background has been in the telecommunications fixed networking, as you referred to, the fibre to the home technology and the birth of uh, our NBN and all of the things that came along with that. And it's really interesting to, to compare and contrast what's going on with, with 5G deployment and the fixed network and how those things come together. So I'm just going to um, share my screen now and I hope everybody can, uh, can see the presentation okay. Um, I'm hoping that that's coming through all right now. Uh, can somebody yeah. confirm that yeah. they can see that okay? Yep. It's okay, Jeff, yeah. Okay, excellent. Okay, so my, my scope today is to really uh, do a bit of an introduction uh, and uh, limit myself to, to not talking about um, a very exciting next 20 or 30 years in this sector, but um, to what's going on right now. Uh, and to do that, I'm going to just dive straight in and of course as Paul said we'll deal with some questions after Matt's talk a little bit later. Uh, I, I wanted to start with just a little bit of context uh, around what where 5G is positioned in terms of uh, the, the planet's population which might seem like a strange connection to make but it, it helps to, to just highlight some of the pressures that um, the telecommunications providers are under when it comes to dealing with global population growth. Uh, when we started uh, the game of mobile technologies in the early 90s with analog, um, the population of the planet was around uh, a little over 5 billion. And, um, and at that time, the use of mobile phones was so new that only a very, very tiny fraction of 1% of the population were engaging with that technology. And as we shifted to the first digital version, 2G, um, that that step was a very important step because it moved us into a, a digital domain. And since then, um, the major steps through the 3G and 4G infrastructures and now into the beginnings of 5G, it's important to, to kind of recognize that, that the 3G build and the 4G build both took um, about a decade to complete. Um, and in fact, you could argue that they were never complete. They just shifted emphasis from building one infrastructure to building the next. But in each case, it took about a decade to get fairly decent coverage in most markets. Um, and so when we talk about the deployment of 5G uh, today, what we're talking about is a program of work that will probably take about a decade to deploy as much as the telcos are likely to deploy before we, we move on to future generations of the technology. And we'll um, be talking more about that in the in the final version of this series uh, later. But I, I just think that it's um, it's valuable to re really recognize that in in today's world where we're approaching 8 billion people on the planet, an incredibly large percentage of that um, are mobile phone users. And with the introduction of the Internet of Things, it's not just people anymore, but it's devices. And there are already more devices connected to the internet than there are people. And that will continue to explode even further. So uh, they're, the, they're kind of the main reasons why both population growth and the internet of things and associated uh, other devices that, that really put pressure on the need to deliver the next generation of mobile technology 
because each generation significantly improves the efficient use of the radio spectrum that is allocated for mobile phone use. I'm going to talk a bit more about spectrum later because um, because it plays such an important role in what you can and can't do with these technologies. And there are some really interesting um, myths and stories around what 5G is capable of. And uh, one could argue that it's uh, capable of doing almost anything under almost any circumstances. But of course, uh, nothing is that good. And I want to try and explain some of those issues as we go as well. So of course, when we are talking a little bit about technology, it's always necessary in the telecoms industry to have a network diagram. Uh, sadly, though, I don't find this terribly useful, um, but I did want to make a few points to, to just kick things off here. Uh, you'll notice on this diagram that there are a whole range of different sub network um, components which are not described in any detail. And of course, we, we don't have time today to go into any significant detail here, but there are one or two things that are, are really important to notice. Um, one is that the mobile core network there just in that bubble to the left of center um, is part of what is being upgraded to uh, achieve the 5G performance, but mostly the activity is in the remote components, the antennas and the, uh, the transmission equipment at the antennas. Uh, and one of the things that that enables is um, more efficient use of the radio spectrum. And uh, in fact, if you look on the right hand side of this diagram, you'll see that uh, great acronym, uh, Massive MIMO. And what that stands for, MIMO stands for Massive In, Massive Out, which is a very nice scientific term, which is really around uh, beamforming and the ability to uh, not just blast a radio signal out from an antenna and have it connect to a wide variety of people within that cell, which is what all the previous generations of mobile technology can do, but with the use of um, some new technology and around beamforming technology allows the beam to be focused to an individual device so that you can get much more bandwidth or much more performance to an individual device and many, many individual devices all at the same time, uh, which is why the MIMO acronym is there, because you can do this to many, many different devices uh, all at the same time. So it's a, if you can imagine um, if you have a, a a sprinkler in your garden, watering garden, and it's spraying water around the entire garden. Um, every bit of the garden gets a little bit of water. With with beamforming technology, it would change that beam to um, to an individual sprout of water that goes to an individual plant and then moves on and goes to another plant. So for any given moment, one plant is getting an awful lot of water, and and the other others are not getting so much. Um, and that's kind of what beamforming is about. And that really helps to turn a very, very uh, limited amount of available radio spectrum and bandwidth into um, a, the perception of an individual getting a great deal of performance for, for a relatively um, low uh, cost. And, and you'll notice also on, on this diagram, uh, there are things there describing small cells and millimeter wave small cells. I want to talk a little bit more about that too as we as we go. Um, and also down in the bottom left hand corner, um, sensors being connected to, to that. Oh, can I just remind everybody who's not talking to go on mute because there's a few, um, few background noises starting to creep in. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, so uh, as I say, I, it, it really takes going into a couple of layers deeper than this diagram to really get into the guts of how 5G really works. And really, it's not our place today to, to go there. Um, I'm much more interested in talking about uh, the differences between the current technologies and the future technologies and how that manifests itself in terms of uh, user behaviors and expectations. Um, but one, one of the critical things about 5G is that it's a much more distributed architecture, which means you end up with a lot more of the processing technology, the ability to handle sophisticated applications and services right at the edge where the antennas are, rather than in that core network, which is where it used to be in, in 4G and previous generations technology. So that ability to distribute the processing and distribute the intelligence does really dramatically improve many of the characteristics of the, of the mobile network. And I'll say a bit more about that as well. So yes, you've probably been interested enough in 5G to notice that when you hear conversations about it, 
you hear that it can do everything. Um, efficiency is improved, high, higher quality services, lower latency, um, higher throughput, higher capacity, longer battery life for, for sensor networking. These, these, in fact, are all true, but you can't actually have them all at the same time. And uh, just if you apply simple laws of physics, if you were delivering a service that was running at a gigabit per second, you would not be running on a long life battery that would last for years and years uh, because the energy required to handle a gigabit per second is far more than it is to handle a very small amount of data for a sensor that might actually need a long life. So um, you have to compromise and you have to make trade-offs and you have to pick which characteristics you need to, um, to deliver the capability that you need from, from the network. And in fact, uh, one of the easily as most misunderstood things about 5G is that it's not at all like previous generations of mobile technology. It's not uh, an upgrade from 4G to 5G. It's actually three different networks that come together to provide all of these features. So there's a, a low band frequency um, network, a mid band frequency network and a high band frequency network that deliver collectively all of these sorts of characteristics, but they, they're not all um, delivered out of one service. They're a combination of things. And I, I want to talk a little bit more about that too as we go. Um, and, I, and I use that term latency. Um, latency is one of the easiest, most misunderstood terms in, in this story. And I, I just wanted to quickly um, divert our attention to what latency really is. And what this chart does is try and show the typical latency of uh, a large number of typical services that you would expect to see running over a, a mobile or indeed a fixed network. And if you look at things like at the bottom of this chart, um, chats and web page browsing, you can see uh, that, that the graph indicates um, anything up to, well, this graph is in milliseconds, so that's 4,000 milliseconds, which means four seconds. If you were, if you were um, chatting to a bot, on a, on a web page or indeed browsing a web page, if it takes a second or a couple of seconds for a response, you would be quite satisfied. Under normal circumstances, that will deliver the result of a typical conversation or a typical web browse, and you wouldn't really be concerned. So the need for low latency for that kind of service is pretty much non-existent. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, if you go right to the very top of this chart, you see a 0.25 millisecond, which is 250 microseconds worth of latency. Now, in highest frequency trading, and that's stock market trading, where automatic software tools um, trade on the stock market based on instantaneous share price information, I've heard it said by various people around the world that if you can save a half a millisecond there, then you can make a billion dollars difference in your trading for a day. Um, and so the idea of having very, very rapid response to um, an algorithm that's doing an, a, a real-time trade on the stock market, uh, latency really, really matters under those circumstances. Uh, and if you go, to, go down through the list here, you can see a whole lot, lot of different performance requirements, things like um, uh, 360 degree um, video uh, for visualization and, and, um, and real-time real video analytics and things uh, is, is kind of about in the middle of this chart, which is something around 40 milliseconds. Uh, and things like uh, streaming video uh, don't, don't require good latency at all. Uh, doesn't matter whether you're going for 4K video or 8K video or, or the next generation of high quality video. It's not, latency is how quickly does the video start, not how long does it take to download it or how long does it take for you to, to play it, but it's how long does it take to start. And, and nobody really minds if a video takes, you know, half a second to start. But what they care about is that they get the quality and consistency of the bandwidth required to deliver it over the, the duration of the video. So I think um, latency is something that it's all about the time it takes something to start or the, the response time out of the network. And because the distributed nature of 5G um, is, is such an important part of its architecture, latency is improved. Um, and in fact, the best latency comes out of the most highest frequency band used for 5G, and we'll talk about that in a moment as well. But I think that this just helps to illustrate it. you don't need super great latency for many typical services, and it's only a very small number of very advanced services that do need 
a very low latency. And one of the most talked about subjects in 5G is the use of 5G for uh, managing autonomous vehicles. And uh, you can see on this chart, and this is the last one I'll refer to, is uh, a, a maximum of about eight milliseconds is considered okay for autonomous vehicles. Um, and that's because of the real time nature of the information that cars have to process uh, to, to be safe. Now, a, a side comment there is that I, I'm not a great believer that 5G will ever really play a real time role in autonomous vehicles, because I think that uh, autonomous vehicles are likely to be able to get better latency and much better performance out of near field communications and various radar technologies that are going to be used um, to position and understand what's in and around uh, an autonomous vehicle. And 5G will play a role in doing things like doing major system upgrades to autonomous vehicles and delivering entertainment to vehicles as they move around and delivering adjunct information like uh, data around restaurants and, um, and petrol stations and all sorts of other, or, or charging stations, I should say, battery charging stations. Most autonomous vehicles will be fully electric. Um, but, you know, that, it's it's a really interesting industry debate and once again we'll come back to that so to sort of summarize the key performance characteristics of this new 5g technology under some circumstances you can get 10,000 times the amount of traffic that you could get with 4g and i'll explain a bit more about how that's possible in a moment um, you can get something like 100 times more devices per cell or per square kilometer of ground, uh, you can get latencies down to under a millisecond under some circumstances. You can connect devices that can give you up to 10 years of battery life under some circumstances. Um, you can get some very low cost kinds of services and you can get um, very high data rates and very high average data rates as well as peak data rates. However, Oh, and of course, with ultra reliability, I mean, the ability to get very, very high availability and very, very high reliability is architected into the network and the distributed nature of it um, enables that to be potentially more available and more reliable than the existing 4G network. And, but all the developments for these things and the ability to deliver all of those things is happening via a program of work that uh, does involve focusing in a couple of main domains. So uh, what this chart is trying to illustrate is that there are three real dimensions of development going on in 5G. There's the massive machine communications dimension, which is all about the Internet of Things, um, very low cost networking, very long battery life, very low bandwidths, but um, uh, ideal for sensor networking. There's the extreme mobile broadband domain, which is all about being able to deliver very high bandwidths to very large numbers of people to do the sorts of video and uh, augmented reality things that are being planned. And there's the critical communications dimension, which is all about uh, improving reliability and creating a, a network architecture that is more resilient um, and more capable of supporting more variety of services and the other component of 5G, which is not talked about a great deal, is that it's um, ability to be shared with a number of different carriers rather than having to build separate networks for each uh, carrier. Now, whether the carriers will indeed do that is a good question. And in Australia at the moment, none of the carriers have any particular plans to share their networks, but the technology is designed to make it shareable and partitionable so that they can each offer the sorts of services they want without affecting each other. Um, it remains to be seen whether that will actually happen in Australia. One of the other um, most important features of 5G is... Jeff, Jeff, uh, Paul here. Yes, Listen, uh, it's very interesting, so I'll give you an extra five minutes, but can you, can you keep it within the next five minutes? I will do everything I can to do that, yes. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. Um, I wanted to make this point that uh, the link between the fixed and the mobile network gets very strong with 5G. Uh, 5G is able to uh, integrate between the fixed and the mobile network in such a way that services can be um, blended 
between fixed and mobile networks without the users being aware of it at all. Uh, and that that's a very important characteristic and a very valuable one. So um, the idea that the, the 5G network can switch you between the various three different networks within 5G that I referred to, but also can, can switch you into the fixed network and out of the fixed network as you move around. So you might be at home connected via Wi-Fi to your fixed network connection via NBN. And it, as you move away from your home, the service can automatically switch over to the 5G network and, and take control and, and be managed that way. Um, I'm going to say a couple of quick things about Spectrum because I, I think it's really important. And then I'll, um, I'll wrap things up. Uh, radio spectrum is one of the most important characteristics of a mobile network. It's a very rare commodity. It costs a lot to buy capacity. And the, the, you can see in the middle of this chart that, that mobile phones operate in this middle domain. Uh, and I'm not going to talk much about this, but one thing that you can do is uh, PANSA is the federal agency, the Australian Radio Protection and Nuclear Safety Agency, that publishes a lot of material around uh, the way um, phone uh, technologies and other technologies affect people and, and they publish a lot of very credible and, and valuable information. So I would recommend that if anybody wants to follow up on uh, the, the different characteristics of the different frequencies, then they should do that. Um, but this chart kind of brings it to, to a point, and that is that uh, 5G is going to actually have a very, very high band operating, a, very, a, a mid band operating and a low band operating when the carriers ultimately do deploy all of the networks associated with 5G. And you get very low latency, but very narrow coverage at very high frequencies. You get very high capacity, but less coverage in the middle band, and you get very uh, low latency um, and ultra high, high bandwidths in that high band and much, much lower uh, bandwidth in the low band and that's very important um, okay I'll jump over that I, I did also want to say that when the carriers start to deploy the millimeter band technology up around the 60 gigahertz different parts of the world are using different frequencies um, which all have roughly the same sorts of characteristics and performances but Australia is allocating a relatively smaller chunk of that radio spectrum than other markets so won't see quite the same bandwidth availability in those in those bands so I think I might wrap up by just highlighting that um, over the evolution of the next 10 years, we will see existing use cases migrate from 4G to 5G and see some interworking between 4G and 5G. Then we will see an introduction of standalone 5G with more evolving use cases and much more interesting new use cases over time. And you'll notice that this diagram doesn't have any timeline dimension on it. Uh, this came from Ericsson and they certainly weren't willing to put a timeline dimension on that. Um, and equally, today we're in the mode of fixed wireless access using 5G technology and that's gradually turning into uh, smartphones and tablets through uh, this year and beyond. And we will really only see the scale of it in cities um, over the next couple of years and nothing really in regional Australia um, around the millimetre band for a long time. Uh, so I think that's where I might uh, finish up, Paul, uh, by just wrapping up and saying, uh, Matt is going to talk about the, the impact on cities and, um, and there's a great deal of interesting conversations to be had about the implementation. Um, my one comment I'd like to leave us with as a transition between myself and Matt is that uh, there is a great deal that can be done and it's all about the data that comes out of these networks. So learn to love it. That's where I should uh, finish. So thank you, everybody, for your attention. And Paul, sorry for going into overtime. No, that's that's it's, it's fascinating, uh, Jeff. It's so interesting. That's why I, I wanted to give you some extra time. Uh, Matt, can I hand over to you? Yeah, yeah thanks, Paul. Um, Yep, I'll just uh, share my screen now, so I'll do that. Okay, so hopefully you can see the slide uh, deployment considerations for cities and regions. So, yes, yeah, look, it's there, Matt. It's there. Thank, thank you, Paul. <clears throat> Excellent. So, look, thanks, guys, um, for joining the masterclass today. Um, 
my section of today's masterclass is going to extend out um, some of the, the things that Jeff has touched on um, about deployment and, and what 5G means um, in terms of a new level of impact, I suppose, across cities and regions um, throughout Australia, down at the, um, particularly down at the street level, um, through the use of small cells that exploit the higher band frequencies of spectrum that Jeff mentioned. And I'll just, yeah. Okay, so just first of all, um, so, so guys, I'm the national president of um, the Australian Smart Communities Association. Um, so we've worked together with the Australian Computer Society to put on the series of master classes around this topic. Um, so ASCA uh, represents uh, city councils, regional councils, quite a number throughout Australia, um, a number of state governments. Um, and we just basically work together to collaborate and, and, and try and understand and exploit best practice and opportunities out of this emerging space um, in relation to smart cities, uh, the development of smart communities, but it does also have a pretty big tie into the requirement for the next generation connectivity um, that we all need moving forward to realise um, the, the benefits that we're talking about. Uh, 5G is uh, the, the new generation mobile network technology that, um, you know, we are starting to look at and, and it does tie into some of these deployment um, uh, challenges and opportunities that I'm going to focus my presentation on today. So I've just got a, 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 a sort of uh, slide uh, page up now that talks about I suppose, where does this all fit um, in terms of, you know, applying this sort of technology enablement across any urban or regional environment, which is basically the advent of, of what smart cities and smart community development stems from. Um, you can see in the data transmission level, you can see that 5G sits in the same area that we've got with uh, things like LoRaWAN, Wi-Fi, um, other types of connectivity networks, but it does uh, play a, a part, and, and Jeff mentioned this, of, of a wider implication, and, and it is really very much about, um, you know, the, 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 the goal that we're seeking is to enable technology to give us more of the real-time data of uh, what an environment around us is actually doing in real time. Um, we, we all manage cities um, uh, traditionally um, as governments based on static data, data that we collect um, as part of an effort. Um, and, and we've also got a, a whole bunch of transactional data uh, through things like um, paying your taxes and your rates uh, for, for councils and, and things like that. But we don't really have that real time data about what is happening in the environmentals of the city and region at real time. And this is what this whole effort is, is actually about, is to fuse that real time data in, you know, in a way that it's uh, interoperable, that we can uh, fuse it together with the static data and enterprise data that we've already got, and then in turn um, create the environment where we can start moving into predictive uh, uh, analytics and starting to use uh, the advent of AI and ML, uh, machine learning, to try and start working out and solving problems, um, hopefully before they potentially happen. Um, this is a process that's you know in train now, um, but it will take us you know definitely at least the next decade and probably beyond to actually make this part of the the fabric of the the urban and regional rural environment. 5G plays a massive um, part in, in trying to help um, make this happen moving forward. So this is just a different uh, graphic here. Um, it, it's based on what Jeff was talking about, about the characteristics of 5G. And there are three main characteristics, and I won't repeat them, but they are very much uh, centred around much, much uh, higher bandwidth um, and the capability of that predominantly through the higher band spectrum that will be 
uh, rolled out in the coming years, um, mainly in city environments uh, to begin with, and then in time, perhaps um, out to more rural and regional environments. Um, and that is the, the millimetre wave spectrum, um, the 26 gigahertz spectrum that uh, we, we hear so much about. Then we've also got the ultra reliable low latency connectivity, which is uh, important for a whole range of uh, uh, applications, including connected um, and autonomous vehicles and, and other uh, applications of the like. And then we've also got the layer of 5G capability that talks about um, the concurrent connectivity for mass amounts of devices, um, including sensors. Um, so massive amounts of devices concurrently connected. Um, 5G uh, has the promise to help um, dramatically with that, but that's only when full um, uh, capability 5G is rolled out. So the other point I'll just quickly make is that the 5G that we're seeing being rolled out now by uh, the three mobile network operators in Australia is basically the first generation of 5G, which really focuses more on the uh, better bandwidth uh, elements. Um, as we get the different spectrums that are coming, um, will be auctioned off and the 3GPP body, the international body for 5G standards, are still actually working through fusing the new standards to enable uh, the um, massive amount of, co of concurrent connectivity for sensors and also the ultra reliable low latency. Uh, they're still moving through that process. Um, so we're at release 16 of the 5G standards has only just been released, uh, release 17, is due to be released next year and coupled that with the spectrum and also the uh, the equipment providers, the Ericsson's and the uh, Nokia's and dare I say it internationally and not so much in Australia, the Huawei's um, of this world will um, embed those uh, technical specifications into their equipment um, that the carriers can then choose um, to, to roll out as part of their networks. So that, that's a really important point. The 5G that we've got now is just an upgrade uh, overlay of 4G, uh, and it's not the full capability 5G that we're talking about um, in, in these presentations. We probably won't see a nationwide rollout of that full capability 5G till probably the second half of the decade uh, is, is my um, assessment of, of how things are, are traveling at the moment. So again, um, just more about those uh, those capabilities of 5G. So we've got, you know, the, the mass data rates, the latency and the mass amount of connections um, to, to drive uh, these applications that we're talking about. But I suppose I'm, I'm just leading now into the areas that I wanted to focus on for the pre today's presentation, which is how will 5G change um, the uh, deployment landscape, uh, um, basically at a street level. Um, we're starting to see with the use of small cells that exploit that high uh, band spectrum, the millimetre wave spectrum, like Jeff mentioned, the ability for those small radios and antennas with that type of spectrum to, it, 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 it's, it's not a huge amount of distance um, that they're able to drive out that signal that drives that um, that, that extra bandwidth and that higher grade that we're talking about. Um, this is why the telcos will need to augment their tower networks, which is what we've had in the previous generations of mobile networks, 3G, 4G, and, and before that, um, with the street level um, small cells that cater for very, very smaller um, areas of, of coverage. Um, what that's going to mean is that um, in time and starting with the central business districts and high traffic areas of our cities, um, the uh, mobile network operators will look to deploy these small cells, these small radios and antennas on infrastructure like street light poles, traffic light poles, bus shelters, um, you know, sides of buildings, building rooftops, 
Um, th these are these are new areas um, that will have never hosted uh, this type of mobile telecommunications infrastructure uh, before. And this is where it gets really, really interesting from uh, the government viewpoint, both uh, at the federal, state and, and local levels about, well, what is the impact of that going to be? And are there ways that we can work collaboratively with the industry and the mobile network operators to drive better outcomes in terms of um, the siting of some of that infrastructure, the type of assets it's going to use, the look and feel of that um, of those uh, of those small cells um, in terms of visual amenity, and of course, making uh, the community uh, you know uh, it becomes community viable in terms of uh, dealing with electromagnetic emissions and and all those other things that um, inherently are a part of uh, what this these networks are all about. So, like I said, we're going to see, even including, I mentioned <coughs> light street lights, bus shelters, even um, potentially some of these smart bins that are being uh, rolled out. Uh, and, and again, you know, some of this infrastructure, this street furniture is traditional street furniture and things like those smart bins are only just emerging. Um, some of the things that um, will need to be considered moving forward is making sure that there's uh, communications connectivity to feed these type of street furniture pieces of infrastructure. Um, so obviously they all uh, mm -hmm. need uh, power. Um, but in the past, we haven't had to worry about huh? any communications. Can, can, there's somebody uh, has the mute off. Can you please switch on your mute? We've got background noise. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Yes, I was, I was hearing that too. Um, th this, is a really, this is a really big consideration um, that we haven't had to deal with in the past. Um, and, and it's going to change some of the extra amount of uh, communications or, or what some are calling digital plumbing that needs to go into the ground moving forward to ensure that these type of, of pieces of street furniture are, um, are, have the ability to be connected, typically with fibre optic cable, but at least that the conduit, the pit and pipe capability is there from the outset. And, and that's some of the work that's starting to emerge um, and, and, and looking at how we can change planning and development type of regimes to uh, make that part of uh, what's built um, as we build things uh, brand new. I'll just move to this um, graphic here. So th this is basically, you know, a, a, a very crude, I suppose, representation of an end-to-end an -end, uh, sort of 5G network. So we've got the, the mobile network operators have their core networks. Um, they connect up to towers. Um, those towers uh, have the sort of what, what's called the macro cell, um, you know, which is in the past 3G, 4G, and will still be required for 5G moving forward. Um, but then we go down to that pole level type of infrastructure, which is that new small cell layer that's going to impact the, the street environment for the first time. So we're seeing things like smart poles where, um, mobile network uh, equipment can be concealed within those smart poles. Um, it doesn't have to be a, an integrated smart pole. It can be a pole with uh, that uh, that new equipment attached to the side. Um, but you'll also see those poles potentially host extra infrastructure like sensors and the like um, as, as we move forward to try and collect that real time data. Um, the spectrum that we can see there delivers that out to our user base and also there is um, the ability for um, the, the backhaul component to connect up um, via um, wireless spectrum in, instead of fixed line fibre. Um, that will be uh, used on a as, as required basis due to a, a range of factors. But basically there is all the elements of what um, a 5G network will contain and of course within that spectrum like Jeff mentioned we've got 
low band, mid band, and high band spectrum that that forms uh, part of that mix. So when we talk about at the city or community level, we've got uh, you know a, a, a sort of a, a graphic here that talks about the, you know what the the cities and the regions have and what the service providers have and, and how we can bring that together to look at a, a range of potential deployment models. Um, so cities and regions are very, very interested in 5G for a whole bunch of use cases, both for within their own business, but also for the wider uh, benefit of the economy, um, uh, you know, in their particular areas. And cities and regions, councils and state governments, will they own some of those street assets? Um, of course, cities don't uh, aren't in the game of being a telco, um, and they um, don't own or have access rights to spectrum, and and that's probably what um, not not on the purview of any city in Australia uh, looking to get in that game um, uh, directly on their own. But I'll talk about um, some models, including neutral host, um, where you know a third party could potentially. Uh, get involved in in um, investing in acquiring spectrum. Um, the service providers are the mobile network operators in Australia, and we've got the three, as we all know, um, who are deploying 5G um, at the present time, and that is Telstra, Optus, and and TPG Telecom, which is the merged Vodafone and TPG. Um, they don't typically own that street level or have access rights at a deep level to those street assets, um, but they need to roll out this network because they own Spectrum and they're looking to uh, deploy um, that full service capability uh, from a commercial sense. So here's a couple of, uh, I suppose, scenarios as we get down to that street level. So what the, these and these are all scenarios that will typically um, either will happen or could happen depending on different models that might be put forward uh, as we as we move forward. And um, there are a number of uh, government agencies around Australia right now just at least exploring what some of these models might look like uh, from from their own viewpoints and just see from a, a feasibility. Um, uh, viewpoint what uh, potentially could work uh, moving forward. So here's an example of um, a small cell that's installed on a streetlight pole. Um, in the case of this one, it's actually Telstra owns, uh, in this circumstance, owns all of the infrastructure. They own the antenna, they own the box. In this one, they actually own the pole, they own the cabinet that houses some of the electronics and they own the duct and fibre that can feed um, that uh, that uh, small cell um, to to work as part of a 4G or 5G type environment. But we're probably going to see potentially a lot more of this emerging. Where and and I just use 5G city, but you can just basically that, that's just a, a a bit of a marker there just to represent a city council, a regional council, um, or a uh, state uh, government-owned utility-owned asset. Um, so for, in this example, it's the same again, except that the, the local council or the utility owns the pole. Um, in this example, Telstra still will deploy and own all of their other infrastructure. Um, and this is what you'll see most typically moving forward where it's the local council or utility who owns the pole um, and, and a carrier like Telstra or Optus or TPG will um, do an access agreement um, to that uh, pole to host that infrastructure uh, in moving forward. But there's also other um, extensions to that where the city um, may have duct um, and potentially fibre assets that could be utilised by, in this example, same again as before, but this example is Optus. So Optus, um, in this example, um, could utilise not just the pole, but it, it could also be the duct and or the fibre that might be owned by the local council or the utility or the, the government entity. Um, so that's just a, a graphic that represents that particular scenario 
which we may see become common moving forward. Um, the the um, number of cities that have extensive duct and, and fibre assets that feed existing poles is probably not huge, but definitely in central business district areas um, across Australia and other built up areas, you may see some of that scenario moving forward. And of course, there could be opportunities to test that model in, in greenfield scenarios and new development scenarios as we build uh, new developments uh, into the future. And then probably the last one represents where we've got an active share model. Um, so we've actually got the city owns the pole, the city um, owns the, the, the duct, um, potentially the fibre. Um, in this example, we've got uh, TPG Telecom and Optus um, who are looking at potentially sharing the cell, an active share model. Um, again, this is still emerging. It's not uh, necessarily commercially and technically viable for 5G, especially with millimetre wave uh, spectrum at the moment, but we could and we probably will see that emerge um, into the future based on uh, some of the activity that's happening internationally. Probably the, 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 you can see the, the city council owning um, the, the antenna or, or even potentially the, the spectrum. Again, it's, it's a potential model. It may or may not stack up in that regard, but definitely that uh, middle graphic where you've got Optus and TPG Telecom both you know, using active sharing to deploy um, potentially their own services um, is, is definitely a model that um, is worthy of uh, further investigation, further analysis as an industry at whole, not just um, in isolation, but collectively in partnership with the industry, with the carriers, with uh, the enabling asset owners like the, the city councils, regional councils and state governments to see if that can stack up um, moving forward um, in, a, in a 5G environment over the coming three to five years. Matt, can you, can you start wrapping up slowly? I, I certainly can, yep. So basically what this uh, slide talks about is why, why is this so important for city governments, um, state governments, city councils? Well, it's the proliferation of visual um, pollution um, that could um, potentially happen. And we want to work together to try and see if we can minimise the amount of, uh, you know, new radios and antennas that could be deployed. Um, so definitely from a community viability viewpoint, that's why gov the government side is interested. And of course, from the industry side and the mobile network operator side, the less amount of uh, you know individual kit that needs to be rolled out will obviously uh, lessen the uh, the amount of capex investment um, if it's uh, viable and feasible both technically and commercially uh, to to move forward in this way. Um, we're starting to see some of that um, done in some international trials. Um, so we've got. Dense Air, who um, have or were active at one point in Australia, they're doing some work in New Zealand at the moment to look at um, multi-operator models, um, but based on a neutral host, and I will get to quickly what a neutral host is shortly. Um, but this last bit of my presentation is, is trying to, uh, I suppose, look through and talk more about the passive and active sharing opportunities that ought to be uh, uh, investigated in, in much more detail over the, the next couple of years, um, especially as we move into the economics of uh, network deployment for 5G uh, out into the rural and regional areas of, of Australia. Um, this is uh, a project that is in train right now in New Zealand. It's the New Zealand regional black spot, but it's based on a shared infrastructure. Um, so you've got one cell, multiple telcos, um, you know, delivering their individual services off that shared active infrastructure, the radios and the antennas, um, and, it, and it's working um, very, very nicely in the New Zealand rural and remote environment. Um, talking very quickly, passive sharing. So when I, when I say passive sharing, we are talking about 
site sharing, multiple uh, carriers putting their uh, macro level antennas on big towers. That does happen uh, quite a bit in the Australian context. Uh, transport where they are sharing the backhaul um, or the fibre optic feed to those towers. Um, but we're, we're talking now into more of the active sharing, the active electronic sharing. So sharing the antennas, sharing the radio controllers, potentially sharing um, spectrum, um, which we could see, and, and also potentially sharing elements of the core network. You'll see some uh, acronyms there, RAN sharing, um, MOCN and MORAN, and I'll talk about that very quickly before I wrap up. So the passive sharing, like I explained, is sharing the site and the tower. We're seeing uh, a, a lot of that uh, or, or increasing amounts of that moving forward. You could argue uh, from a government viewpoint that they would potentially like to see more of that. Um, of course, with radio frequency planning and site planning, it's not always um, you know, technically feasible to actually do that um, as, as a simple exercise, but ideally that's, uh, that, that's something that everyone would potentially like to see more of. Um, the backhaul, so we're talking about the cables and fibres, the lease lines, microwave, and we're talking about sharing more of that uh, trunk feed to those tower sites. This model here is the multi-operator RAN or the MORAN. So what we've got here is we've got um, the site sharing, um, but we're getting into the active uh, radio and antenna sharing. Um, we're not sharing, the, the mobile network operators are not sharing the spectrum in, in, in that model. Um, but again, if this was technically and commercially stacks up based on some of the international trials and, and, and rollouts that we are seeing now, especially in Europe and Asia, um, this could become a, a big part of the landscape uh, potentially moving forward uh, with the mobile network operators, uh, probably probably you know later towards the, the mid term of, of this next decade uh, in front of us. And then we've just got the next version of that um, shared uh, mobile network operator where even the spectrum is being shared. So again, it'll be interesting to see if that is on the agenda as we move into the spectrum spectrum auctions moving forward. Um, but again, these are models that are worthy, again, at this time of at least investigation, especially as we're trying to deploy uh, 5G across a large area like the, the country of Australia, but with a very, very small density or low density of population um, for, especially in our rural and, and remote areas. Um, the last thing I'll just very quickly um, finish on, then I'll wrap up, um, is that the ASCA has um, done some pieces of work in the past to look at um, what are some of the community viable rollout principles of 5G and other types of infrastructure like uh, low powered wireless area networks like LoRaWAN and Sigfox. Um, you know, what are some of the things that ought to happen and, and need to be investigated uh, between uh, the various players, government, uh, industry, the mobile network operators, and you are able to still view that uh, paper or all that draft for discussion paper at that link in the slide. So that's the end of my presentation. I'd just like to thank you, and I might just hand back over to Paul now. Many thanks, uh, Matt, and, and also very interesting. And, and I really like that um, uh, aspect from, uh, from a user in this situation, the cities, yeah, rather than just being at, um, a, technical, uh, a technical layout of, of the whole situation. So I think that also will give us uh, some good um, foundation for the questions. I already saw quite a few questions coming in. Uh, so what I would like uh, you all to ask is, you know, have, have a short break. Let's do it um, uh, five minute break. And then uh, you've got some time to um, uh, uh, to put your questions in the chat. And then I will monitoring the chat. And um, uh, after um, uh, it's now, it's, let's say, quarter past five, then we uh, 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 come together again and we start the, the question uh, the question session. 
question and answer session. So, um, you know, get get your answers ready and, and I will look at them and uh, yeah, have a quick, uh, a quick uh, coffee or uh, water or whatever and see you at quarter past five. Thank you.
slowly moving back. If you guys are ready, um, good to see that most of you are still uh, with us. And um, yeah, one of the key elements, of course, of meetings like this is um, is what I call the question and answer session, uh, because that gives you an opportunity to get that those insights of these uh, two experts that we have uh, to talk about the um, uh, you know the issues that you would like to uh, uh, to de dig in a little bit deeper or have uh, uh, questions for for the the speakers. Uh, I would like to ask uh, Matthew Perry to uh, unmute and um, to ask the first question. Uh, Matthew, are you there? Matthew's question is low latency expectations are of course continually increasing each year and each new system demands better what he asks what does it does it require yeah okay let, let me have a crack at that one to begin with um, he, um, he's absolutely right uh, expectations are growing constantly and there is absolutely no doubt that what would be acceptable today in a decade's time would be considered completely unacceptable. And that has been the case for as long as I've been working in this industry. So um, I have no doubt that it will continue to be the case indefinitely going forward. The, the, the challenge when you just pick latency is um, that it is one of uh, quite a big group of service characteristics which have relevance and people get used to the performance um, of each generation of technology for use uh, in the areas of interest. So today, one of the biggest usages of mobile networks is in fact um, a combination of video streaming and things like social media, Facebook and the like. Um, it's, it's acceptable in today's world to have uh, a perceived short delay on Facebook and it's even okay to have a brief moment of delay be be before a video starts to play, um, because chances are you spent several minutes deciding which one you wanted to watch in the first place and adding another second to that doesn't do too many people too much harm. But as the service uh, choices start to get more sophisticated and we start doing things like augmented reality type services, and that would be one of the big uh, things that puts a lot of pressure on latency and bandwidth, then our expectations for that performance will change dramatically. You know, uh, and when I let me just use one very simple, quick example that the idea that you could um, be uh, walking in a city that you've never been to before or in, or in a part of your city that you're unfamiliar with and you and you simply look at a particular building uh, trying to get your bearings, you, you may um, using augmented reality, get a lot of detail about the the, the, the use of that building, its history, the, whether the person you're interested in is actually in it at the moment, or that there might be all sorts of additional information that might be provided to you to augment your physical experience of just simply walking past a building. Now, if that if that um, delay to get that information is is more than a couple of seconds, then you will have moved on to a different building and not had any relevance to to you while you were walking past it. Um, so that latency starts to become really important, and the, the more you look around the more you will be concerned with information about all of your surroundings, not just a building you're walking past. So as those tools get better and better, the idea of augmenting your whole experience um, works if the latency is incredibly low. Um, in today's world, you know, it's unsophisticated, so you can deal with some latency, but as those services get more and more sophisticated, we will simply not tolerate it. And that that's an expectation that just never ends. So we always want better. Yeah. yeah. Matt, anything that you would like to add to that, or? Oh, look, look, nothing more really to what Jeff said. I mean, totally concur with with what um, what, what Jeff's comments were. Um, I, I just feel as we're moving into more the importance of real time data processing. Um, you know, we, we we haven't really seen that yet, um, powered by a mobile network. 
um, and, and 5G has the potential capability to either in full or at least in part um, help with that, especially like Jeff mentioned in his presentation around um, data processing for autonomous vehicle guidance and, and safety of of that. Um, you know, we, we're going to, you know, what, what we're going to have in our lives in 10, 15, 20 years time is just going to be a, a really, really big focus and increase on that real time network connectivity, ultra low latency to support some of those functions that are just going to become commonplace. Yeah, what, what I hear uh, in the market is that, um, you know, are there already business models for 5G in the millimeter wave? I mean, you know, the, the IoT sort of area. I mean, it's still a lot of um, uh, information and call it hype or whatever. Yeah. But as um, uh, Jeff already clearly indicated, you know, the whole situation with uh, uh, autonomous vehicles, yeah, is, is questionable with 5G. Uh, you know, then on the other side, you've got. Uh, the IoT as we've got them now, you know, the, the, the LoRaWAN and the, and the Sigfox, etc. So do we need 5G for that sort of, uh, that sort of um, IoT or is the current IoT systems, are they good enough? What, what, what do you think there? I'm sure we both have contributions to that answer. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll start. <laughs> um, that's, that's a big question because um, in in my opinion, we have a great need for all of the things that you described, not uh, a perilously close to religious argument about which one is the best or most suitable. The answer is we need all of all of them. And uh, spectrum, uh, licensed spectrum that's very expensive is a rare commodity. It's scarce and it will always end up getting pretty full. Um, unlicensed spectrum uh, doesn't cost anything to use. There's not much of it and it will too get congested. Um, we have the problem that uh, if you need mobility, if you're doing an IoT project that requires you to have sensors on uh, on, on vehicles for managing the, the movement of supply chain, you know, food in a supply chain, uh, you'll have to use the mobile network to do that because the other technologies aren't really suitable for that. Uh, on the other hand, if you want to do a lot of um, video analytics, then you're likely to use a direct connection of fiber or, or, or wireless connected into a fiber network and probably won't use 5G for that unless you have a real problem with, with the need for backhaul. There's, there's so many variations on that theme. Uh, my short answer is we need all of everything and we should just make sure we use the best fit for purpose choice in, in each case. The most important consistency across all of those things is how data flows um, and how we how we work with sharing data and how we effectively manage data. That's the common thread that, that finds its way through all of these technology choices. Um, 5G is critical and necessary, but so are all the other ones. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Jeff. I, I definitely concur with with Jeff, um, but but I think it's actually a question of scale, Paul. So right now we don't have sensors out in the field we you know what what we've got what we've deployed so far is minuscule in what will actually happen over the next you know five ten fifteen years so so right now we're not at scale um you know if, if people think that our urban environments are censored up well that they're, they're incorrect they're, they're not censored up we, we don't have those 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 data feedback mechanisms installed uh, readily um, and and at scale. So as we move towards scale, which we inevitably will, um, we, yeah, we, we're going to need fit for purpose networks, and 5G will be a part of that wider mix. Um, and time will tell how big a part it, it actually becomes. It's got the theoretical capability of be of being a, a really central part. Um, and, and we'll just see how that goes uh, over the next, you know, decade. But but really, it's it's scale. We we haven't even started to roll out the IoT that we will have, um, in, in, you know, over the coming decades. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's also Far critical out. to remember how how important it is for the price sensitivity of that to play a big yeah, role. Yeah, that's you know, the other thing. Yeah. 
telcos will will pay a lot for the spectrum to deploy 5G. They have to recover that cost. Uh, it will be a, a very price sensitive set of decisions that everybody will be making when they deploy these technologies. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I, it's absolutely true that affordability, you know, is 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 critical. And uh, yeah, will be interesting to see how 5G brings that for, uh, that affordability. But I would like to go to the next uh, one on my list. Farad, are you there? Can you unmute and ask your question? Yep, sure. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. Okay. Um, actually, I, I had two questions, but um, yeah. So the first one was. Um, in the initial uh, 5G rollout, uh, somebody, one of the speakers mentioned that that there would be a reduced capability. So I'm just uh, wondering, you know, what what uh, uh, data rates and latencies will be supported in the initial rollouts? Um, and then the second question was uh, the exclusion of Huawei uh, as an equipment provider. What implications does that have in terms of the uh, cost of the network and perhaps, uh, you know, the the uh, time it takes to roll out. Thanks. Matt, would you like to start with that? Yeah, well, well look, in terms of the first question, I mean, you know, the, the, the initial rollout of 5G is only using um, mid-band and, and pieces of low-band spectrum. So, you know, we are definitely seeing um, you know, a, a good, healthy um, bandwidth increase. Um, I just noticed, I think in the last week, uh, I read in comms day, um, some uh, real world drive testing that's been done of the networks in the capital cities. And, you know, you're getting hundreds of megabits per second as your average data rate, um, which is a, a really big increase on 4G capability. Um, the, the other technical, I suppose, aspect to 5G is that the core networks that the telcos have got, um, they're, they're upgrading their core networks from a 4G core network to a 5G capable core network. So that's progressively happening as well, which will, which will add to that. Um, so yeah, so, so look, you know, good, good bandwidth increases, um, probably some, some marginal latency improvements as well. Um, but yeah, it's it's because of the the spectrum that's used at the moment um, is only that mid band the 3.6 gigahertz spectrum um, that they're using touches on the you know 800 900 megahertz spectrum so that's low band that that's what the, the the carriers have got at their disposal at the moment and of course millimeter wave the 26 gigahertz high band spectrum is up for auction uh, early in 2021. So that process will, will, will you know, uh, enable that high band element to come into play as well moving forward. But, but I might just hand to, to Jeff now if you wanted to add anything to that, to answering that first one. Yeah, uh, thanks, Matt. Yeah, that, that I just simply add, because I agree with everything Matt said, of course. Um, but just on top of that, uh, there is a really, um, how do you say it? Uh, it's, it's kind of challenging to be specific about answering that exactly because the, the telcos have got a set of features that are built into the equipment today, but how they go about deploying and offering it um, is something that only they can really talk to. Um, you know, and, and they can test a service today on, a, on an empty 5G network and deliver a, you know up to a gigabit per second of fantastic bandwidth to to uh, a test environment, but you put your average uh, 10,000 people into a, into a, a city centre and see what happens to that performance. It's a shared environment, and that bandwidth will be shared with all the active users um, within that environment. And it's that environment that will see the pressure to deploy the millimetre band stuff when it's available and when it when the spectrum's available. And then we'll see that that number jump back up again, perhaps even to the gigabit per second range for for individual connections. Um, but it's so so shared that it is very, very dependent on like the, all the mobile networks in the past in the number of active users within a cell and the available uh, spectrum. And, and when it's a mixture of mid band and high band frequencies, users can seamlessly, but won't even know they are, they will seamlessly move between those networks to get the very high performance if they need it. You know, um, 
not too many uh, users in the next decade are going to need a gigabit per second, but they may get great value out of a burst of a gigabit for one or two seconds. So they'll switch over to the millimetre band spectrum for a couple of seconds to get the content that they were seeking and then switch back to the other network for uh, more mundane use uh, because they're not putting pressure on the network at that time. So it's a, it's a very complex answer, sadly, to a simple question. Um, your second question um, is also a complex one, um, and one always tries to uh, avoid questions like this for fear of being quoted dangerously in the, in the media for, for saying something inappropriate. But um, I would, would say that there's really only three possibly four major mobile technology manufacturers in the world. Huawei is one, Ericsson is one, and Nokia is the other. They're the three biggest by far. Um, all three of those companies manufacture almost all of their product in China today. Uh, they have different design centers in different parts of the world, but all of them manufacture the technologies in China. So the cost of the equipment is r rather similar, regardless of where you get it from because the cost base is rather similar for all of them. Um, however, with three players competing in the market, you always get um, more pressure on, on selling prices and you always get pressure on, on uh, performance and features. So uh, the fewer players there are in the market, the, the, the fewer competitors there are to drive down costs and to drive down prices and to drive up features. Um, and that will have a bit of an effect, but um, Australia has almost always used uh, the infrastructure from one of those three players, and that's Ericsson. And um, Ericsson has been tested by the other players in tenders over many years with the telcos and has been able to retain their um, their market dominance in Australia for the fixed network, uh, sorry, for the mobile network for, for the previous generations. And so uh, that incumbency is worth a lot. Uh, I guess Huawei would put a lot of pressure on Ericsson's prices to retain the business, and as does Nokia. So um, uh, maybe it doesn't change things too much. Uh, but Nokia and Ericsson and Huawei are all trying to differentiate themselves globally on uh, deploying new features of 5G as the standards become more stable. And they are all competing globally for that business. Um, so it, it only has a minor effect in Australia. Thank you, Jeff. Um, Alan Wilson, are you there? Could you un unmute and ask your question? Yes, hi. Um, I'm from an electricity distribution organization, so I'm not from a telecommunications background, um, but I'm really interested in this active sharing options. Um, we have a lot of regional and rural areas which have challenges with connectivity. Uh, and we recognize that the telecommunications providers are going to be slow to roll out the these technologies to areas where it's they haven't got the ability to get the return from the cities. So I'm just really interested in this sharing option of whether there's ways to make it more attractive or alternative business models for uh, regional cities uh, or regional councils or even electricity distribution organizations to take over that shared infrastructure. So it's, uh, it, I don't have a specific question other than to say I'm really interested in this um, and would love to explore it more. I, I like that very much, Alan, and, and I think you're very right. You know, we, we haven't seen a lot of collaboration uh, among uh, the carriers, and, and, and that's, I think, why it's interesting to get Matt's um, uh, comment on that, because uh, the cities could play an, an, a pivotal role in actually make this happening. And, um, you know, I think it needs a little bit of extra force from the cities to actually make it happen. So it will be interesting, Matt, to hear from you what, what you think of that. Yeah, well, well, exactly that. I mean, you know, the, 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 some of the more proactive governments are, around Australia are starting to look at what this might mean to them um, and, and how deep into those models the, 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 the state government or the, the city council, the regional council might play. 
Um, there's probably some initial things that make some sense though. The, the, the issue that we've got is in the street environment, you've got a range of different uh, authorities that own and control some of these enabling asset pieces of infrastructure. So, so some of the, the early thinking is can, can a facilities access agreement be unified um, across different um, uh, authorities or players within a particular geographic area and, and make at least the business of passive sharing. So uh, having the, the carriers still install their um, separate equipment, but on say a, a single pole as an example, make that uh, a bit more easier, more feasible, and um, you know, from, from both the, 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 the government side and the, and the um, carrier side, um, in, in terms of the active share, look, look, you know, it's still a, a journey, I suppose, that we're moving towards. Um, some of those models are, are starting to be proven for a 4G environment, which you might look at the, the rural and remote type of scenarios um, where you can promote more of that active share. Um, with 5G, with the different characteristics like the high band spectrum, um, you know, I suppose technology Will, will come where some of those potential challenges and barriers to active share and you know, for millimetre wave might be solved in the coming, uh, you know, uh, you know, number of years. But but look, you know, there's a there's a range of ways that a utility, a, um, a you know, a local council can play, and it's just a matter of you know trying to do some analysis. Um, uh, you know, about how deep, uh, you know, the number of assets, for example, that they might own, um, you know, the, the street light pole assets uh, are not typically owned by councils. They are still owned by the electricity authorities, um, but, but you're seeing some of the councils starting to take on that asset in new development areas. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's just a matter of, of, of that analysis uh, to, to figure out what's feasible. But any way that you can make it easier to do business while still protecting the community um, with the outcomes that are community viable is, is definitely what a lot of the, the more proactive governments are starting to look at. Thank you, Matt. Uh, I've got quite a few questions. So, sorry, Jeff, I, I continue with the questions. Uh, Nam, uh, Nguyen, are you there, Nam? Yes. Thank you. Yeah, my question is more about uh, what, what do you see as um, the potential for private 5G networks, uh, in, in particular using, you know, license free spectrum. Um, there's been talks about that a lot, particularly in the US, I think, uh, opening it up, like even using the citizen band or CBRS type spectrum. I'm not sure what the um, what the spectrum situation is in, in Australia, uh, and also whether there, there are demands for uh, uh, license-free spectrum and private networks, because it might also open up opportunities for you know um, for for you know commercial research centres where where they need that sort of uh, networks. So the the four G private networks you know, in Australia has grown slowly, you know, particular for also regional rural area as well where there's no connectivity um yeah so so that was my yeah i i can just add a little bit to that nam um that the the uh, acma which controls the licensing of spectrum in australia has been doing some work on uh, some of the low band uh, allocation of spectrum for the low frequency 5g which is good for sensor networking and, and wide area coverage um, but as to my knowledge, they've not done anything in the uh, uh, thinking about uh, making any of the millimeter band free for any use. Um, there, there's actually a lot of uh, a lot of learnings over the last decades about how to extract uh, good revenues for government out of licensing the spectrum. And the millimeter band spectrum is the the area that's least occupied now because it the technology is really only catching up with the ability to, to use it effectively. Um, and I think they're going to be very careful about uh, making sure that it's all licensed and all managed in a way that 
probably doesn't make it terribly easy for private networks. Having said that, there are plenty of 4G private networks around and they're in areas where the telcos haven't bothered to buy the licenses and therefore they've been able to uh, use that spec that the, the private companies have been able to use that spectrum at relatively low cost because there's no, nobody else in the area for some of the big mining locations, as you know. So, uh, yeah, unfortunately, I don't think millimeter band's going to open up for uh, private use too much. Okay. Um, Michael Riley, are you there, Michael? Yes, Paul. Um, Matthew and Jeff, thank you for sharing your insights. Um, my question is about the Humble Street Poll, um, which is becoming um, very sexy. <laughs> um, it's also the intersection of where where fibre meets um, wireless. So whether you're developing a Greenfields site uh, as a property developer or you're looking at uh, retrofitting brownfield sites as a council or a municipality, one of the key questions that you're asking yourself is because multifunction street poles cost more than traditional street poles, what is the, what is the mix in, in my streetscape between normal poles and multifunction poles. And one of the key drivers of that is um, is the positioning of 5G um, small cells. So my question to you as a rule of thumb, and I know there probably is no one rule of thumb, uh, depends on the landscape, but as a rule of thumb, how often would you, uh, what would be the distance that you would use between small cells, say on a new development? Um, great question, and I wish there was a rule of thumb because there, there sort of isn't, um, unfortunately, because like you said, that, that radio frequency site planning is, is the key that the telcos will, will put in place to site where they need infrastructure. Um, but, but some of the work I've been doing in, in, in my consulting day job is starting to look at the proliferation of the mix of smart poles within um a, a, a new urban environment um so so typically you know roughly you've got a a street light pole every 25 meters thereabouts maybe maybe a little bit further depending on how how dense your development is um you, you could argue that in a an, in a suburban street environment that you won't need every one of those existing street light poles to ever be a smart pole. Um, you could you could argue that you could you could take that view. Um, it might be that every fourth one or something like that might become um, a, a smart pole if it's housing some extra sensors around air quality or traffic counting or, or something like that. Um, of, of course, when you get into a more dense environment like a, a central business district main street or an area that's servicing a high-end um, you know business or, or research precinct then that uh, density of smart poles may increase but 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 look you know it the, the issue is is that every smart pole that gets installed as that rule of thumb will not necessarily be a candidate to ever host a, a 5g small cell based on the the, the rf site planning that's required um, so you know it, it's it's trying to mix those different elements together um, but, you know, the, unfortunately, there's no ready rule of thumb that I'm aware of that, you know, you can master plan and, and get that right straight away. Matt, I Matt, Matt, but I think there are uh, differences between those sexy um, street poles that we now see start seeing emerging and the smaller antennas that's needed for the millimeter w w uh, uh, system. Yeah, it's, they're different. They can be different, or they should be different. And the the smaller ones are, I assume, less less obtrusive than the the sexy ones that um, you know that are scattered around. What what's the 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 combination between the two, or the uh, you know how many of each, or you know what yeah. sort of what it's hard, it's hard to know, Paul. You know this this is all new, right? So um, it's it's hard to know fully that um you know obviously you know cities and, and councils would like to see unobtrusive um sort of new infrastructure installed um within limits um and and obviously from the mobile network operator side of the equation they need to 
look at that and deal with that that you know where it's commercially and technically feasible to actually do that as well so um you know it, it we, we're going to see that you know get looked at and and sorted in time um but but i suppose for, for me it, it will be you know as i crystal ball it, a, a mixture I, i'm not i'm certainly not an advocate that every single street light pole in a new development needs to be a a multi-function smart pole in the sense that all things that it does is hidden within the pole um, you know you can definitely hang some some sensors and some equipment on the side um, because you, you've just got to balance you know the nirvana type of objectives from a community viewpoint with the actual commercial realities of of, of the cost to actually make it happen yeah yeah, Jeff, Jeff. yeah. yeah just just a quick addition to that um the very worst case scenario is when there is no sharing and three carriers deploy their own yeah. millimetre yeah. wave uh, networks in, in dense parts of cities. And if they do that, then it's pretty likely that every pole will end up with infrastructure on it, sadly. Um, but bear in mind that the millimetre band stuff only works when you have line of sight, uninterrupted line of sight to the, to the antenna. And uh, so that the distances have to be uh, with one carrier, you know, less than 100 metres between um, cell nodes. But if you've got three carriers and, and they're all doing slightly different things, then you might end up with every pole um, with one carrier or others in, uh, infrastructure on it, or, or even uh, all three could be on, on the same pole under some circumstances. Because these small millimetre sized cells are, um, they're not much bigger than a, a Wi-Fi access point type of box. So they're not uh, huge antennas yeah. like yeah. like the macro cell antennas but nonetheless um, as Matt suggested the cities really hate the idea of cluttering up the cities with more and more antennas and and so they want them to be disguised they want them to be hidden now hiding something that you need to have line of sight to to make work is not easy that's an interesting contradiction in specs um, so uh, hiding things and minimizing their appearance and clutter is a real challenge and it's in fact uh, one of the, the next session that we we're running. Um, Tegan from uh, Melbourne City Council is doing a lot of work in that domain and probably would be um, well placed to provide some input on that uh, in the next session. So uh, yeah, because yeah. The, the 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 carriers do have this access right, and uh, and and on the other side, of course, we do need some regulation in order to uh, uh, to make it manageable. And I think there's also the whole health scare that's still going on. That will prompt uh, councils to, uh, you know, to, you know, it's whether it's right or wrong doesn't matter. You've got this health scare, yeah, from communities. So, you know, councils will have to um, come up with some regulations, I think, to do that. And hopefully, the carriers don't need that and are going to work together. But we haven't seen that sort of level of collaboration in the past. But the next question, Claire, Paul, Paul, are you there? Just quick, Paul, just quickly, Sorry, mate, just, just on the regulation side. The, the power of the councils and the state governments in Australia to make these holistic regulations is, is not achievable. No. OK, so fr from a regulation viewpoint, it all stems from the Telecommunications Act at the Commonwealth level. So, yeah. you know, the, the, the councils, unfortunately, would love, possibly love to, you know, make deeper or changes to that to those regulations and but it's just doesn't have the ability to do so so, so I, I think that's just an important point uh to, to make to the audience yeah hopefully with some people power you know you start seeing that uh, the government will come to the party and start looking at it in a more serious way claire are you there claire mewing yes ah thank you so uh, the question was sort of answered um, there, but I'm just interested to hear perspectives on um, the role in alleviating some of that community fear that, as we've said, is is kind of growing, um, and particularly local government. Um, I think whilst it's tempting to kind of ignore uh, if we're going to achieve our smart city visions, it's something that we need to to take into account and you know work out ways to bring the community along with us or you know things like smart poles are going to be vandalized long into the future so yeah i'm just interested in in uh, perspectives on that yeah, who wants to take it jeff, uh, jeff. 
It's a tough one. Um, <laughs> and, and we all like to duck and weave this because what I've found is the more we talk about it, the more people worry about it. And so we should talk about it less, not more. But anyway, that, that aside, um, it is a really uh, challenging area because there is it's so easy to find so-called scientific evidence to prove any point you want to make on the internet. And unfortunately, that so-called scientific evidence is almost never very scientific. Um, and the work that's being done by reputable organisations is not the stuff that's easiest to find. Um, it's all of the uh, all of the conspiracy theorists who who are using the internet to to make everything so much easier to find that it's easy to be scared and it's easy to be derailed by by uh, things that are just completely not scientific at all. Um, what I find quite ironic about this is that by far the most energy that you're going to be exposed to is the energy coming out of your phone, not the energy coming out of the tower. And um, the, the closer you are to the tower, the lower the signal is that's coming out of your phone. So the intuitive thing is the closer you get to the tower, the, the, the more at risk you might be. But in fact, the opposite is true. And the same is true with many, many other aspects of, of radiation from um, emitters such as transmitters and, and, and phones and all the other devices around us. I think part of the answer is much of this technology is going to become more and more and more invisible to, to the users of it. It won't be that we have a phone that does everything. It'll, it'll be that we, we have lots and lots of things and those things are connected to these networks all the time and we simply won't even be aware of them because they'll be invisible to us. You know, the fact that um, uh, our car has got 100 computers in it, um, none of us can say what those 100 computers are doing, but they're all there and adding value to that car and doing things that make that car better for us as people. But we don't look for the Intel inside symbol on a car purchasing decision. We just take for granted that they're there and doing it. Now, in the next generation of 5G and, and cars will be connected all the time, doing all sorts of things that, that we can't even imagine. Um, and we won't even be aware of it, but the car will just be better. And I think part of the answer would be many of the things that people are concerned about will simply go away because they'll be less visible to them. Uh, and I know that sounds like a very, um, very unsatisfactory answer, but I think um, the visibility of large towers is scary. The visibility of little Wi-Fi hotspots, they're not scary. And the 5G millimeter band things are going to look more like that, so they won't be scary. And if councils do achieve some of the results that they're working on right now, then many of them will be not visible to the public. They'll just be buried into the infrastructure of the city. Um, and uh, and that will help. Not a very good answer, I'm afraid. Uh, Matt, do you want to add? Otherwise, we go to Mohamed. Look, I only to say that we just need to work collaboratively with industry, the mobile network operators, and be transparent with the community. Um, that, that's really how we can address that uh, together. Um, but yeah, I mean, what, what Jeff said is, is, is correct. So yeah, probably not heaps more to add to that. Mohamed, um, are you around to ask your question? Uh, thank you, Paul. Uh, I have a question related to the security aspects of the 5G, uh, where the number of uh, devices, smart devices are connected to the street poles. So the smart devices have uh, limited resources or maybe one of the smart device may be compromised, can compromise the whole tower or maybe you can say the street pole and it's compromised all the devices connected to it. So I am just interested in what the security aspects are covered under the 5G. Thank you. Yeah, no, it's, a, it's a really good question and it's something that we need to pay more attention to as a, as a society, I think. Um, one, one of the really good things about the 5G standards is that they really address uh, making security a critical component of everything that 5G supports. So the short answer is 5G is way better at security than the previous generations. The challenge becomes that the more of the security features you implement, the higher your costs are as an operator. And so there's this trade-off between do I implement every security feature of 5G and offer a very expensive service that is incredibly good and secure and, and performing to the maximum for security? Or do I have to compromise that a little bit to make it more cost effective for the people that I want to sign up to the service? And if, if pressure from the community says uh, security is number one, 
then the carriers will market the security features as something worth paying for. Um, if they don't and, and the community doesn't take it seriously, then they will probably have to compromise on some of those features to make it affordable for people who don't care about security. So it's very much in the hands of, uh, of, of the way people perceive the value of security. And we do have all the necessary features built into the 5G standards to support all the necessary security that we would probably ever need and going forward with the, the evolution of those standards, um, they will get better and better over time as well. Um, it's the, the question is, are the carriers implementing all of those features and can we afford them? Matt, anything to add? No, nothing, nothing more to add to that one. Um, uh, Mark, um, uh, can you just answer David's question on the uh, on the chat, please? And then I would like to go to uh, Sandy. Sandy, it's good that uh, to not to see you, but in any case to hear you hopefully uh, shortly. Um, can you please ask your question? Sandy, are you there? Okay, then I will read Sandy's question. Uh, what are your perspectives on how the mismatch of fiber rollout, public and private, with the 5G rollout will play out given fiber is needed for backhaul, backhaul or not, especially say in outer metro and regional areas? Can the state city play a role in this? And perhaps I would like to add to that, uh, you know, the NBN sort of question of 5G and NBN. Um, Matt, yep. you want to give that a start? Well, well, well definitely. There's there's a lot of opportunity for other players to get involved in in that. Um, but um, yeah, look look, you know, back all networks, uh, you know, uh, are in. Uh, play um, and and in, and in the ground, um, you know, when when we get out to into rural and remote areas is when we start, you know, not having that type of connectivity in place. Um, so, um, the, you know, can the NBN be used? Well, well, technically, yes, it, it can be used. Um, will it be used? Well, that's the question. Um, you know um, that we that we need to to you know see what happens, but. Um, you know, I mean, look, you know, definitely the commercial aspects of 5G will mean that uh, the, you know, more profitable areas for the telcos will be rolled out first, and that is typically a high traffic areas, central business districts, um, you know, around stadiums, um, you know, around those sort of high traffic corridors, and then in time, we will see it slowly come out into outer metro suburban type environments and hopefully concurrently in, into, you know, emanating out of the more populated regional areas and, and eventually maybe into rural and remote areas. Um, I think rural and remote still needs to focus on 4G, um, you know, then, then, then 5G. I think 4G is, is still the, the focus for rural and remote areas of Australia to get more of that network rolled out. Um, but yeah, look, there's parts to play, um, but um, if those players want to play or um, have a desire to play will be the, the, the thing that we'll see moving forward. It's, it's, it's a great question. And one of the things I'd like to add, which is one of my favorite subjects, is that the NBN architecture for the current fiber to the curb or fiber to the anything but your home uh, model is almost perfect for 5G backhaul wherever that deployment is in place. But legislation currently um, means that NBN doesn't get used for anything but fixed services. Uh, I think it's really interesting to consider uh, encouraging government to change the NBN scope a little bit to enable it to be used for, for 5G backhaul because I think in, in many parts of the country it would be the most cost effective way of, of doing something that um, is, is expensive to do otherwise. Um, I would also add that the main motivation for carriers to invest in 5G has been the, the great density of people in major cities. Right at the moment, that doesn't exist. And as a result, it is very interesting to think about whether remote working and people staying more in their regional areas rather than commuting to cities is going to shift the, the build profile of 5G and actually see 
more regional investment happen a little earlier because people are working from home and, and living and, and staying closer to home rather than uh, coalescing around major cities. I think there is, uh, I doubt that the carriers are planning for that yet, but it's quite likely that their profile of deployment may actually be a little bit changed because of the different behaviours that we're seeing in, in the community. Commuters are not going back to the cities right now. They're, they're working more and more from home, as everybody on this call will attest. Uh, I know it's six o'clock, but I've got one last question. Uh, Mez, are you there to ask your question? I think then what I will do if Mez is not there, I won't uh, use his question because it's now six o'clock and uh, 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 it's uh, it's time to stop. I would very much like to, um, uh, to uh, thank Matt and Jeff, I can clap, clap for all of you guys. <laughs> and uh, it were great presentations. Thank you very much, delegates, for the for the questions. Absolutely fantastic questions. Uh, a great discussion. I always like the discussion. Uh, what's uh, uh, you know? I think this is one of the highlights. A couple of things uh, um, that yeah. the next session is on Monday, the thirty first of August. A case study from the current projects underway, and I think Jeff already mentioned uh, mentioned that uh, Melbourne, the city of Melbourne, is involved in that. Uh, for those of you who have registered this afternoon, you will automatically re receive an invite for the next one. And um, we, um, uh, Mark uh, Portak, will uh, have a link uh, for the slides for the presentations tonight. We also have a recording of tonight's session, which will shortly be available on the ACS YouTube channel. So keep an eye on, on the emails that you get in relation to that. Uh, Mark, I also want to thank you for organizing this. Uh, it's all working greatly. Uh, and to everybody else, have a good have a good evening. Enjoy the evening and thank you very much. And hopefully see uh, many of you back on, uh, on Monday. And once again, Matt and Jeff, thank you very much. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Paul. Thanks everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, guys. Thank you, guys.